So welcome back, everyone. The coming presentation is a joint research by Professor Leso Sonai and Dr. Gaber Coax, but it's a pity that Professor Sonai can't join this conference at the end. And before the presentation begins, I'd like to invite Dr. Guang Xing, Director of the Hong Kong Youth Center of Buddhist Studies, to introduce our two contributors of the coming presentation. Dr. Guang Xing, please. Professor Lance Zoni is a well-known economist, and he has a huge interest in Buddhist studies. That's why he published so many papers, and I actually I used many papers he wrote for my uh, teaching. Uh, but unfortunately, as Carol said, he was not well, and that's why he said his uh, representatives come here to read his papers. Uh, and he is also the president of these uh, uh, specs and our co-organizers and uh, he contributes quite a lot. And he's also helping our center in so many ways. For example, uh, Ernest PhD external examiner also. Uh, so in many ways, he's a leading scholar and also a leading economist. Uh, therefore, I just introduce you is uh, Dr. Karol uh, Kowalski, and he's coming here on his behalf to read his papers. So please, Dr. Kowalski. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I have some slides. Can you? Oh, thank you. Okay. So this will be a joint presentation we, together with uh, Professor Joanay. Uh, who unfortunately cannot uh, come here personally. Uh, so I try to, to speak in plural and not in singular. Our presentation on Buddhist economic thought and action will have uh, four parts. In the first, first, Buddhism and economics, we would like to uh, say about some cornerstones in the history of Buddhist economics. In the second part, principles of Buddhist economic action, we would like to introduce you five basic principles of uh, economic actions that could determine whether an economic action can be considered as a Buddhist economic action. In the third part, uh, we would like to talk about uh, mindful markets and the three levels of mindful markets, and we will uh, end with some conclusions. So, uh, now we would like to highlight you some of the major contributions to Buddhist economics. Uh, this is not a full list, and it's very subjective. Uh, this is just a short outlook. Uh, it started, as it was mentioned before, in the early 70s by Ernst Friedrich Schumacher, who was the first who mentioned or conceived this phrase, Buddhist economics. It was in his uh, best-selling book called Small is Beautiful. Uh, Schumacher, uh, the main problem for Schumacher was the metaphysical blindness of the science of economics. So that was the problem uh, he was in, engaged with. Uh, he told that uh, economics uh, refers uh, itself as something which is absolute, an absolute science like uh, physics or mathematics, uh, without any prep presuppositions. His intentions was to provide some metaphysical background behind the science of economics. And uh, he chose uh, to fill this gap uh, with Buddhism, with the philosophy of, of Buddhism. Uh, and according to his confessions, it was very incidental. So he could have chosen 
any other religion like Christianity, Islam, or something else. But as he was working uh, in Burma for a very long time, he chose Buddhism to solve this problem. According to him, the two major characteristics of Buddhist economics are uh, simplicity and nonviolence. The second uh, uh, cornerstone in the history of Buddhist economics was uh, the venerable Prayut Payutto, as it was mentioned before today. Uh, he has published his book, uh, The Middle Way for the Marketplace, in 1994. Um, he summarized the two main characteristics of Buddhist economics as uh, the realization of true well-being and non-violence. According to him, the realization of true well-being means that uh, satisfying basic needs, basic human necessities, and above that, uh, one and anyone should uh, simplify their own desires in order to uh, achieve happiness or to and suffering. The third uh, event was a conference in 2007 organized uh, by the Business Ethics Center of the Corvinus University of Budapest and the Budapest Buddhist University uh, with the title Economics with a Buddhist Face. This was the first uh, academic conference organized with the title or devoted to the discussion on Buddhist economics. And more than 35 presenters were there from Asia, from Europe, and from the USA. There are two books. Uh, the first on the left-hand side is uh, Business Within Limits. Deep Ecology and Buddhist Economics, uh, edited by Professor Jolai and Professor Ims, who is also here. This is the first volume, this was the first volume in the Frontiers of Business Ethics series and published by Peter Lang in 2006. It contains 11 papers uh, from the fields of Buddhist Economics and Deep Ecology and the intersection of these two fields. And on the right-hand side, another book uh, published by Springer in 2011. It was edited by Professor Jolnay, Ethical Principles and Economic Transformation, a Buddhist approach. It includes 10 papers, but all of the 10 papers are devoted to the subject of Buddhist economics. Of course, there are other papers, books, and events that can be mentioned here at the history of the evolution of uh, or the development of Buddhist economics. Uh, for example, there's a book called The Leader's Way, which was written together by uh, Lawrence van der Meusenberg and His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Or we can uh, mention here also the book of Professor Claire Brown, uh, which was published in 2017 by Bloomsbury Press. It's uh, Buddhist economics and enlightened approach to the dismal science, but I don't want to talk too much about this, I, because <laughs> you can talk about this tomorrow. So the second part of the presentation will be about uh, the basic principles of Buddhist economic action. There are five of these principles that can uh, be used to determine if an um, economic action can be considered as a Buddhist economic action or not. The first is non uh, sorry, the minimization of suffering. The minimization of suffering for human and non-human beings. Uh, that means uh, there can be 
uh, economic actions that uh, aiming at not profit maximization, but the minimization of suffering. It is uh, underpinned by the, or its rationality is underpinned by the researches of Daniel Kahneman and Davos Stversky. In their prospect theory, uh, they show that uh, people are loss sensitive. So it can be rational to strive for uh, minimizing suffering instead of maximizing profits. The second principle of Buddhist economic action is the simplification of desires. It is in uh, opposition with the basic Western approach of cultivating desires. And uh, the cultivation of desires is uh, basically at the heart of Western economics, as uh, profit requires ever-increasing demand and ever-increasing consumption. And the uh, root of this ever-increasing demand and ever-increasing consumption is uh, the cultivation of desires. But Tim Kasser, uh, the researches of Tim Kasser has shown that uh, materialistic value orientation can undermine or even destroy the well-being of people and destroy the happiness of people. The third uh, principle of uh, Buddhist economic action is practicing nonviolence. Practicing nonviolence, uh, which is uh, in opposition with marketization. Today, from a Western approach, if uh, there's a problem, anyone uh, would uh, strive to solve this problem uh, by marketization. For example, there are the problems of uh, social inequality or environmental degradation. And the Western economic approach to solve these problems are to introduce markets on these fields of society or environment. So the market-driven violence in society and nature must be degraded. Uh, the influence of the market should be reduced according to Karl Polanyi's uh, theory on substantivism. He said that small-scale, local, and culturally diverse markets should be introduced instead of this kind of global Western marketization. The fourth principle of economic action is genuine care. Uh, it is in opposition with the Western way of instrumental use. Uh, the instrumental use of any stakeholders and any resources, even if we're talking about human resources or natural resources. So genuine care can be pay off. As Robert Frank, a uh, US economist, showed that caring organizations are rewarded for their possibly higher cost of caring. As uh, he, so Robert Frank, showed that there are five dimensions in which these uh, genuine care pays off. First, the opportunistic behavior of managers can be avoided by genuine care. Employees can and will work more for less salary. Third, High quality new employees can be recruited. Fourth, the customer loyalty can be gained. And fifth, the trust of some subcontractors can also be gained if uh, an organization avoids uh, the instrumental use of, his, or of its resources. The fifth and the last principle of Buddhist economic action is generosity or giving. Giving without expecting any return. It's very similar to dana, which is the first virtue according to Buddhism. 
and its, its uh, rationality is underpinned by the Homo reciprocans model, which is in sharp contrast with the, the Homo economicus model. Uh, so the Homo reciprocans model or theory uh, says that people tend to reciprocate what they get. That means if we give, then we will get back more than we gave. And it works only also in the negative side. So it's worth to be generous because we will get back. At the end of the second part of the presentation, we would like to show you uh, the comparison of uh, Western economics with Buddhist economics. So Western economics is a maximizing framework in which uh, profits, desires, the influence of market, instrumental use, and self-interest are being maximized. In opposition with this, Buddhist economics is a minimizing framework. It strives to minimize suffering, to minimize desires, to minimize violence, and to replace instrumental use or minimize instrumental use and replace it with uh, genuine care, to minimize self-interest, and replace it with generosity. So according to the Western approach, bigger is bigger, bigger is better, sorry, and more is more. And according to the Buddhist approach, small is beautiful and less is more. The third part of the presentation is about mindful markets uh, on three levels. Mindful markets consist of uh, mindful consumption, mindful entrepreneurship, and mindful economic policy. The first is on the individual level, the second is on the organizational level, and the third is on the policymaking level. So mindful consumption must be wise. That means mindful consumption serves one's true well-being. It is also nonviolent. That means it doesn't hurt other sentient beings. And it's compassionate. That means it helps others to satisfy their basic needs. And uh, there are many examples for mindful consumption. Uh, we show you some of them. Of, go of course, this list is also not full. So first of all, vegan food. Consuming vegetarian or rather vegan food is not uh, better for your health, but it's much better for the natural environment than uh, consuming meat. The second is the efficient use of water. The third is ecological housing. Even if we are talking about the building process of the houses or the sustaining process of the housing. The fourth is ethical clothing. Or using preventive and natural medicine. Eco-literacy. Sustainable energy use. Buying, purchasing fair trade products although trading should be minimized, should be, yeah, minimized to a minimal uh, scale. Or indulging in ethical banking or ethical investments. Mindful entrepreneurship uh, is the application of Buddhist virtues in business. Mindful entrepreneurship is uh, practiced by organizations or the leaders of the organizations by applying these Buddhist virtues in business, even if we are talking about production or trade. So production is only truly justified when the value of things 
produced outweighs the value of that which is destroyed, which is in line with the conceptions of uh, Priot Piotto, who told that it can be rational or it can be uh, for the sake of well-being not to produce or not to offer a service for somebody because it's much better not to produce something than to produce that good. So there are uh, four examples of Buddhist businesses. I do not want to talk about Patagonia in details because uh, it was already shown by Professor Ims and Professor Payne in before noon. So I don't want to talk about this one. I'm not sure I want to talk about this one because Chuck is here who is the who is the expert of Greystone as uh, he was the president of the Greystone Foundation for more than 10 years, if I'm right. Yeah. Uh, so Greystone Breakery was founded in 1982 by a Zen practitioner, Bernie, Gu uh, Bernie Glassman. Uh, if you are interested in, please, <laughs> please ask Chuck. I don't want to talk instead of him if it's not a problem. The third is uh, Apopo, Apopo Foundation. It was uh, founded in 1997. This is a Belgian non-governmental organization founded also by a Zen practitioner called Bart Vietjens. And uh, Apopo is training and applying rats as you see here on the pictures, hero rats, as they call them. They apply rats to detect landmines and to detect tuberculosis uh, in African countries and in Asian countries. This is a very nonviolent way of detecting these landmines and a nonviolent way to reduce suffering, in a sense. And the fourth is uh, a Bhutanese example, the Loden Foundation, uh, which was registered as a civil society organization in 2007 in Bhutan and was founded by uh, Dr. Karma Punzo uh, with the aim of promotion uh, of the promotion of education and social entrepreneurship in Bhutan. Uh, they have three programs. The first is the Loden Entrepreneurship Program, in which they have trained more than 3,400 entrepreneurs in 10 years. The second is Loden Sponsorship Program. They giving financial aid for entrepreneurs in order to, to start their businesses. And the third is the load and learning centers, uh, learning centers for young entrepreneurs. So the last one is mindful economic policy. Right here, I also do not want to talk too much about this because I, because uh, uh, Professor Claire Brown will talk about this tomorrow in the morning session, if I'm right, yeah. But uh, just in a few words, mindful economic policy uh, suggests to uh, evaluate economic performance holistically by measuring uh, three dimensions. How well people live, that is prosperity, how fairly resources are distributed, that is justice, and how well the ecosystems are functioning, which is sustainability. So we are arriving to the conclusions. For the development of sentient beings, human beings and non-human beings, we need economic actors to behave in 
in ethical ways. And uh, as we could see, Buddhism can ensure this ethicality or the lacking metaphysical background behind the science of economics. And so in doing so, economic actors should avoid the vices of greed, hatred, and ignorance, which are the root of suffering according to Buddhism. And they have to ex exercise the virtues of generosity, nonviolence, compassion, contentment, wisdom, and mindfulness, which are the virtues according to uh, Buddhism. So we would like to thank you. We would like to thank for the organizers for organizing this event. And we would like to thank for the Center of Buddhist Studies of the University of Hong Kong for letting us uh, presenting our research here. And uh, we would like to thank you for, attendi for attending this lecture and thank you for your kind attention. Let all sentient beings be happy and peace for all beings. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kovacs. Now the session is open to the floor. Uh, I think we have plenty of time for uh, discussion and questions. So uh, please raise your hands if you have questions. So any questions? Feedbacks. Gentlemen of there. Uh, what does Buddha have to say about uh, relationships between men and women and how they should be run? Right now in the USA, we got a Me Too movement, which I don't quite understand all the way. According to Buddhism, in a philosophical sense, uh, women and men have the ability to enlighten themselves. So in this regard, they are equal. Is it a, an answer for your question? So in a sense, they are equal. They can get to enlightenment. They can end suffering. I cannot hear you now. One is no better than the other, it's just an equal... According to order. ending suffering and according to reaching enlightenment, there is no... Yeah, yeah, there is equality between them. The lady at the front. Uh, thank you very much for your enlightening uh, presentation. You have talked a lot about the uh, ideal situation of uh, doing businesses. And uh, I just wonder whether um, your team have uh, in investigated into obstacles of um, the above being um, practiced as of now or anticipated obstacles. Yeah. In general, so to say, these are here, greed, hatred, and ignorance. In the field of economics, it's uh, very much greed, which can be interpreted as profit motive. So people and the organization want, wants, want to maximize their profit. And that's the reason of the suffering. And that's the obstacle that you mentioned, the main obstacle. The gentleman. Thank you for your, uh, for your speech. I wanted to build on what uh, the lady just before was asking. Um, I watched a documentary recently about, I'm not sure whether you've heard of K-pop. It's the, all the rage right now across Asia, possibly even the world. And uh, they follow a pretty brutal um, economic, uh, they, they, they follow a very brutal method of uh, training their uh, singers and dancers. 
And I think I'd like, I'd like to sort of um, pose the question of whether ideal versus reality. These, uh, these actors, oh, sorry, not actors, sing singers and dancers are put under great pressure uh, to perfect their moves. And the glitz and the glamour that you see on TV uh, is really the result of hours upon hours upon hours of real grinding and, and, and real, um, uh, uh, real suffering. There, there's, even, there's, even, there's even stories of these uh, bands of young women or young, young men uh, being encouraged to sort of um, have an adversarial relationship uh, and sacrifice their own friendships um, and relationships uh, some often friendships generated within their own boy boy band or girl band in order to sort of you know claw their way to the top and become the favored uh, dancer by by these big companies like samsung and and, and other major contractors so uh, what would you say to uh, systems of business that are that seem on that seem to me to be quite inhumane and uh, how how if you were in the boardroom of a big you know a big Korean entertainment company or what where, wherever else, what what would you suggest? Good question. Uh, that was what I was hoping. <laughs> if I take the point, take your point. So does the instrumental use of human resources? Um, in my point of view, there's uh, not so much space for entertainment in a Buddhist world. There is space for satisfying basic human needs. Entertainment is excluded from here. Okay. And then uh, people should simplify their desires, their desires for entertaining uh, themselves. So, in my point of view, entertainment or entertaining is is worthless in this sense. So it must be minimized. If we want to reduce suffering, these kind of things have to be minimized. So we have to not cultivate our desires, but let our desires. Yeah. yeah. Gentleman in the middle, oh, or maybe lady first. <laughs> um, so uh, I think what you described as you know, um, if, if ed everybody ad adhered to these principles, obviously it would be great. Uh, but um, uh, the 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 world is less than perfect right now, um, and um, you know, as uh, some of the um, uh, speakers mentioned earlier this morning, you know, there really is urgency uh, to act um, given all of the huge problems that, that we have. Um, so what would be kind of a, how should one kind of deal with, on the one hand, you know, um, uh, 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 the sense of urgency, right? Having to change so that you know we can we can we can achieve that. Let all sentient beings be happy, and etc. Et um, uh, uh, versus kind of like um, non-attachment to outcomes. So so I'm 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 actually trying to um, gain some wisdom here, which is like you know uh, I I I'm longing to see change. Um, I do what I can. But um, uh, in order to just kind of stay sane uh, is the way to kind of not be attached to the outcome, meaning like, you know, don't expect that the world will change. Um, kind of accept that it is what it is, uh, but just do, do your best. Is that the, the, the Buddhist approach? Yeah, I think yes. Do your best. For me, it says I'm a teacher. I. I teach uh, business ethics. I want to give this message to our, to our or my students. Or in my private life, I uh, 
should be a mindful consumer, as I mentioned. So there are a lot of ways and a lot of uh, opportunities that can be <coughs> practiced in this way. But uh, each and there's, there is no general clue for this. It's like skillful means. So each and every one have to decide what to do and how to do. It's okay. Yeah, it's it's not a happy answer. It's not a happy answer, um, but uh, it can be a subject of uh, another presentation, I think, in my my point of view. gentleman in the middle. Okay, uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, you've named a few uh, examples of um, mindful entrepreneurs. Could you name um, one or two real life examples of mindful policy making you have, um, you have seen? Yeah, could you give us a few examples? Yes, I could, but uh, actually I don't want because as far as I know, Professor Claire Brown will talk about this one tomorrow in the morning. So come and join that session at <laughs> 9, at 9, <laughs> if I'm right. So I can't hear you without microphone. Okay. Um, uh, we are certainly um, uh, looking forward to uh, Claire Brown's presentation tomorrow but I would like to uh, hear your view anyway. <laughs> Sorry for pushing. Thank you. So there are a lot of uh, uh, solutions for this. Uh, from a policy making point of view, there are taxes that can be applied. Uh, CO2 taxes, for example, there are uh, other measurements than GDP like GNH, it was mentioned by uh, uh, Professor uh, Karmoura in the morning session, so there are a lot of, of opportunities for this. So, any more questions? Of there? Thank you. Um, I've been thinking a lot in a lot of these these talks, and I'm have some concerns that the incentive structures behind you know free market capitalism um, prioritize the type of nonstop constant growth and eliminate you know firms that refuse to 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 follow with that ideology. And I was wondering uh, what, how can we create a system that incentivizes uh, the uh, Buddhist economics? I'd like to answer the first point of your question. If uh, these uh, kind of organizations are eliminated or not, uh, I don't agree with this because there are these four examples. These are examples that they are not eliminated. They can flourish even in very competitive uh, environment. So in a sense, it's viable to do something differently than the mainstream or than the Western approach. Okay. So. That's the first point. And the second point, th th that's also policy making. And I, I really do not want to talk about that today, but okay. <laughs> so that's about policy making. If you come tomorrow, you will have another, <laughs> another presentation about this. So I, I don't want to. Sorry, but I really don't want to, to talk 
instead of Professor Brown if it's not a problem for you. Okay, yeah, yeah. So maybe we take one more question. Yeah, this is the last one. Well, uh, I have uh, one uh, question uh, actually uh, relating to the previous uh, question. Uh, but uh, if I may, I like to uh, uh, comment uh, a bit on what uh, 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 the previous uh, 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 question about uh, whether those that obey the rule will basically, uh, you know, fail and disappear, and those who does not follow the rule, right? Maybe something like that. But my understanding, based on you know the presentation, is that both of that have a different objective, right? One is the maximizing profit. So if you continue to you know uh, 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 basically proceeding in maximizing profit, you you feel that you lost. But if you are minimizing suffering, then basically you win. I mean, based on uh, what I understanding. So we were talking about two different. Uh, uh, objective. Uh, with regard to, uh, I, I have a, uh, a question with uh, what we talk about individual. When you said that, uh, well, uh, you know, it seemed like uh, there is no one responsible, like, uh, you know, we're focusing on individual rather than, uh, 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 you know, community or a leader or a politician or community leader uh, type of thing. But uh, I think we have uh, some honorable, he probably maybe uh, can help, because I, my understanding about Buddhist teaching is that you have both. In the all, you know, you practice yourself, but it's also teach that as a parent what you're supposed to do you know, uh, basically, uh, you know, as a responsibility, and also as a community leader, and especially maybe in the old day, I mean, uh, when uh, Buddha uh, time, probably monk or, you know, monastery is the one that is basically help guide us. So, uh, to me, like, there is a level of uh, responsibility in the society not totally, you know, leave it to uh, individual. So, uh, I mean, that's what I was, uh, I, I am wondering. Uh, so how do you uh, uh, basically incorporate that concept, you know, of the Buddha teaching in terms of responsibility, not just individual, into uh, what you're working on the uh, Buddhist economic? Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So if there are no more questions, then um, let's give a big hand again to Dr. Kawax for his presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. So the next session will run in a parallel way. We will have a panel presentation in this hall, which will be conducted by Ms. Annie Chen, Mr. Jed Emerson, and Dr. Ernest Ng. And there will also be another workshop conducted by Renvo Hin Hong and Ms. Bonnie Wu with the theme, A Mahayana Buddhist Approach for Stress Management for those pre-registered participants. So those of you who have already registered for the workshop, please go to room LG61, which is just on this floor. Um, so for those who have registered, please go now.